I'm Jeff Carter with Seattle City Club. And today, as part of our Civic Bootcamp on Housing Instability, I'm here with Josh Castle, Director of Advocacy and Community Engagement with the Low Income Housing Institute. Welcome, Josh, and uh, thanks for joining me. Thank you, good to be here. So let's just start out. Um, what is the Low Income Housing Institute? Uh, the Low Income Housing Institute is a nonprofit uh, that provides affordable housing um, for people who are you know, previously experiencing homelessness and also provides uh, shelter for, for people currently experiencing homelessness along with um, hygiene, hygiene uh, solutions like our urban rest stop program that provides laundry showers and uh, bathrooms for people um, as, as, they're, you know, as they're experiencing homelessness and to kind of help them you know, get, to a better, uh, get to a better place. Um, so we've been around about, about, I think we're going on our, we're at about 30 years now. So we're wow. celebrating our 30th, 30th year anniversary. So what are your, what are your top priorities? What are the, the top projects that you're working on? Well, um, so right, right now, you know, in the last five years, um, so, you know, we've been providing affordable housing for since, since the, you know, that's been the, the basis, our, our main, I guess, um, line, line of business, if you want to call it that, um, since we were founded. Um, and then in, in uh, 2000, we opened our first urban rest stop in downtown, uh, providing laundry showers and, and bathrooms. Um, and then we opened two others, you know, um, you know, in, in the years since, and now we, so we have three of them. Um, and then five years ago, so 20, uh, early 2016, um, which, which is also, by the way, when I started at Lehigh, um, we started partnering with uh, the city of Seattle on um, sanctioning these tiny house villages uh, for people to provide an enhanced uh, shelter option for people who were experiencing homelessness and to provide um, the support uh, and case management and services that they need uh, to help them on their, on their journey to, um, to stability, um, to housing, and kind of help them along, along that journey um, so, and then since then we've, you know, we've opened, um, we've opened, you know, several more and we have more coming up. So let's talk about that. What, what exactly is a tiny house or tiny home village? What, how would you describe it for, for those who don't, who may not know? Sure, sure. So it's an interim solution. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's an enhanced shelter that is an interim solution for people experiencing homelessness. Um, to help them with, with basically um, having access, going from homelessness to being in, uh, in a tiny home that is eight by 12, uh, insulated, uh, it has heat and electricity and a lockable door to secure their possessions, which is a lot of times the challenge, of course, people have is, um, is you know, it's, it's very unsafe uh, being outside, but it's also just really, um, you know, just un unsafe, unpredictable, um, you, you know, and it, it's not secure at all because your things can just get stolen. Uh, they can get, you know, swept by the police. All these things can happen. So a tiny home allows a person, you know, to be in a, in a heated uh, space, insulated space, and then secure their possessions. Um, and then on site at the villages are case managers that work with the residents to help them obtain housing, employment, um, education, health care, um, you know, all, all kinds of services, access to, you know, um, to, to benefit, like government benefits, they may not realize they have access to. Um, and then they help them basically get uh, housing ready and then ultimately help them transition into long-term housing. Uh, and, you know, we have, you know, what else? I mean, these are basically uh, communities. So it's, it's everybody that lives in a village participates in the community in, in some way. Um, and they have a shared um, kitchen space that everyone you know uses um, to prepare food. Um, that that actually uh, organizations uh, come and and bring uh, meals, bring hot meals, and bring them to the kitchen, and then everyone shares in that. Uh, they have a hygiene facility. A lot of times, it's a hygiene trailer or it's like a hygiene building that that has laundry, showers, and bathrooms. Um, and the, and it also has case management offices and a sort of a security operations office that people uh, have. You know, like when there's one way to get in and out and they pass by that office. And then we have a manager in that office. And then these um, staff members called organizers that do the rest that basically do 24 seven support um, outside of when the manager is there. Um, yeah. And so basically we um, it's a program to help uh, get people from um, just from, you know, from out of, out of the, 
the danger and isolation um, and horrible situation of homelessness um, into, into a safe, secure um, you know, community with um, high quality shelter and then moved on into um, housing. And then we can continue to serve more people the more people we move, we move in and out of the village into housing. So would you say this is a transition from people say living in tents or their cars to maybe a more permanent solution for housing? Is this like a transition phase? It is. Yeah, it is. And, and it's sort of like, uh, you know, before uh, tiny house villages and even well, even while they existed there and there still are a tent, you know, tent cities, there's, there's 10 communities. Uh, I think the difference is this has, it's a, it's just a higher, it's a higher quality space, a, a tiny house. A lot of people would probably, would probably agree with that. And um, it just allows, you know, it, it, it's, it's just a lot more, it allows a lot more autonomy, a lot more dignity. Um, you can control, you know, the temperature, of course, you can secure your possessions. You just, you just, you can't do that in a tent. So it, it's just a much, it's much higher quality uh, space. And it, it gets people um, back, you know, um, a lot of times the, the dignity, you know, that, that they um, have lost from, um, from homelessness. And um, so it allows them to, re- to reclaim that um, and then just build up, you know, the, the stability and, and um, you know, the, um, the uh, you know, get the services that they need um, to then, you know, to then move into housing. And that can include, you know, a lot of times people are, are homeless because they've, um, they've lost their, you know, they, they might have a family connection somewhere or a friend connection somewhere and they've, they've lost their, their social connections. Um, and, and it's a matter of case managers can help people reunite with their families or reunite, you know, re- reconnect with those social connections. So a lot of times when, when um, somebody is moving into housing, it's actually moving, you know, being reunited with their family somewhere, you know, somewhere else in the, the city, the state or somewhere else in, in the country. So. Do you, are there statistics or even anecdotal evidence of how effective these are in, in kind of reducing homelessness? Do you have any, any kind of? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so basically since the program began in early 2016, um, we've transitioned over 900 people into, um, into permanent housing. Um, and in addition to that, it's, it's every year, you know, it's come out to an average of about 50% of, of people who exit tiny house villages um, enter into long-term housing. Uh, the majority of that, the vast majority of that is permanent housing. Some of that is tra- transitional housing, which is sort of a, um, a, a place somebody can move to for about, you know, a few years uh, to help them, you know, get, you know, kind of get to that next stage and then move into, uh, move into permanent housing. Uh, that it's just like living in, you know, just, being in, in, in an apartment building or something like that, it's, you know, um, so it's almost like they're in permanent housing, but it, it's actually just another step to get there. Um, so yeah, it's, so basically that is, that is much higher than um, other shelter programs. It's about, it's more than twice, it's about twice or more than twice that of the um, permanent housing, you know, long-term housing exit of um, uh, other forms of enhanced shelter and, and the uh, number of people that, a basic shelter that get into housing is, is a really small number. So it's, it just, it's a much, um, it's, it's proven to be um, a more effective way of, you know, it, 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 we've been, we've been more successful transitioning people into housing than these other programs. So how, how are the programs, how are the, the tiny villages funded um, and how, how cost effective are they? So the tiny house costs about 2,500, 2,700 to build around that. Um, and the, the, the village program themselves, so they're funded by the, uh, by the cities, uh, like the city of Seattle funds um, eight villages right now in, in, uh, in the city of Seattle. And then we also have partnerships with other cities like the city of Tacoma, which funds um, two villages, and then uh, Olympia, which funds, which funds one village. So the operational dollars are covered by, by the city, just the ongoing annual operational dollars. Um, and yeah, so it's funded, it's funded by, these, by these city entities, but it's um, the, the tiny houses themselves in many cases are, are funded by um, private donations and the generosity of the community. So it's, it's people that are, um, that are building tiny houses all over the place, like all over the state actually, um, but they, they build them. It, it could be a, um, you know, it could be like a pre-apprentice program. It could be a construction company. It could be a school. It could be um, you know, like a faith community. 
Um, it could be somebody who's, you know, a couple of neighbors that, that have construction experience that get together to do this. Um, so there's a lot of different, a lot of different organizations and, and community groups out there the, that are setting these up and they're doing it in driveways, you know, in, in their yard somewhere, um, you know, or they come in, in some cases, they'll just come, you know, we'll, we'll build the tiny houses from scratch right on site, right where the village is. Um, right now, we actually have a tiny house warehouse where they're built. So we have we have a whole bunch of them. It's in Soto. Uh, we've we uh, uh, started there uh, several months ago, and so so organizations and, and groups come together and and build them in, in that time in that warehouse. So yeah, it's basically it's it's so like the the capital cost of like building these and and kind of getting them going. It's it's a lot of times it is like privately funded. So hmm. it's just the operational costs that are funded by this by city government. Are you are you part of the? There's a current. Uh, initiative by Andrew Lewis, the city council member, to create a whole bunch more tiny home, tiny homes, and tiny home villages. I think in a coalition with Omni or some sort of development, uh, corporate development. I don't know if you're involved with that at all. Or okay. yeah, we are. Um, so we we're working with council member Lewis on this, um, and Sharon Lee, our executive director, is is on their committee. It it, it takes a village. is what it's called. Um, and yeah, it's a big fundraising effort um, to basically um, uh, uh, capitalize on all this generosity in the community, uh, um, the businesses and, and, you know, and people that wanted, that wanted um, and, you know, wealthy individuals, you know, that want to donate to, to help with, um, with um, you know, building more of these tiny house villages and, um, and basically funding um, a lot of times like funding, especially like the capital cost to build them. Um, so it's, it's a pretty, it's kind of an early effort. It's, it just started pretty recently. So it's, it's a lot of people kind of are, you know, still trying to figure it out a little bit um, and, and how it's going to fit into everything, like how it's going to fit into the, to the picture. But it's, it's, it's amazing. The, we have, there's just a hugely generous community out there, people that want to help. So this is a way to kind of harness that. And what was the, overall goal do you have is there a sense of how many houses they want to build or how, how what percentage more they want to with that initiative um i they're still they're still so, planning a lot of that out right now yeah they okay. just they just had their first committee meeting mm -hmm. they're still trying to just still, still trying to piece that together but they're, they're trying to be a part of this you know the the city of Se uh, seattle solution to get this thing you know just to get to get more of these going they're just trying to, to help out with that yeah well, you, you, you mentioned how tiny home villages seem to be a really good solution, but I, from what I've gathered, people are, are still pretty frustrated with what's going, what they're seeing in the community, which is, I know, just the surface. But what would you say to people who are kind of frustrated or disillusioned with the, you know, the lack of progress or the seemingly lack of progress in, in, uh, in addressing homelessness, especially for the past, what, 10, 15 years? How would, how would you kind of help them get a sense of that there's, there's maybe some hope moving forward and things, things can move in a positive direction. Well, you know, I do the community engagement for Lehigh. Um, so we, we reach out to, you know, whenever we're gonna like um, set up a village somewhere, we um, reach out to the neighbors and the businesses in the area and, um, and just, you know, organizations and schools, churches, everything else. And we hear a lot of feedback. So I've, I've, you know, I've talked with a lot of people that have, that have this, the frustration that you're describing. Um, I'm frustrated too. Um, I mean, I think, I think we all are um, with, with the fact that the, um, you know, there's just, you know, it's, it's like, I think there's people out there, they, they want to, you know, they're frustrated when they see tents that are in, that are, you know, like they, they didn't see tents there before that are in parks or, you know, near in their neighborhood. Um, but they, but they genuinely, they, you know, they want, they want, to help people out that are that are in you know in those situations, and they want to help the folks out that are they're experiencing that. And a lot of times, people like I, when you you know, unfortunately, it's because of like the when when COVID uh, hit. I mean that that definitely had an effect on things. It's like a lot of people lost their jobs, lost their income support, um, and then people that were staying in congregate shelters uh, suddenly had to leave, um, and it just it just scrambled. So the people like had to be you know outside and separate in order to be safe, you know? Um, so that just a lot, of, a lot of people were forced into that situation. Um, you know, I, I think the thing is that we, I think a lot, of, a lot of us are in agreement that we need a lot more affordable housing. I mean, that's kind of, 
an obvious thing, almost almost cliche, but it's it's true. It's we ha- we need a lot more affordable housing, um, and and it's you know we need we especially need a lot more uh, permanent supportive housing to help people that are at a higher level of need. Um, and so it, so I think the um, you know and when it comes to um, to housing, it's a lot of times it's hard for somebody to go to to be in a situation where they're directly experiencing, they're directly out on the streets experiencing homelessness um, to get to get to that. Like, if you don't have, you know, if you don't have a job, how can you get housing? Cause if you don't have income, you know, it's like, if you don't have, um, if you don't have housing, how can you get a job? It's just this, you know, there's all these, all these issues that come into play. And there's, you know, and that's, that's just a simple way to describe it. It's, it's so complicated, um, the challenges um, involved in this. So what a, a tiny house village does is it, is it helps people with, with, you know, getting that next step, getting the services that they need, being, to, being able to be in a place where they can, you know, look for work and, or, or find some kind of income support. Um, and then, and then, you know, be helped out to get into, into housing. Um, so I guess, I guess the thing is, that I think the, um, the success that the villages have had with getting people into housing uh, I think a lot of people have come around that of all different ideologies, you know, all different sides of the issue have come around to support tiny house villages for that reason, because they recognize that the program is not something where we're just, you know, people are just staying put, but it's, it's meant to be a step up. It's meant to help. It's meant to be a stepping stone to help. It's meant to be transitional. And, and it's, it's empirically. So, I mean, we've seen that over the last five years, it's been successful. Um, I, so I think that more, you know, I think getting more, getting more villages going, uh, people that follow this and realize that the program works really well, uh, it, that makes them feel a little bit of hope that, it, you know, the city is, is, you know, that other cities are starting to do this as well because it actually works to get people into housing. Um, now, homelessness is such a huge, I mean, so many people, there's, you know, 5,000, 6,000 homeless in Seattle. And that's, you know, that's, you know, probably way more than that. Um, and so the thing is that one, one, thing I, one thing that was passed by the city council was this jumpstart tax um, that would allow a lot more, you know, funding for affordable housing and, uh, and, and services to help people experiencing homelessness to get to that next step. Um, and so I think that, that that's hopeful as progressive sources of revenue. So we are actually able to do that um, as, a, as a city. Um, so I think that that's a sign that things are, you know, that, that's, that does help a little bit. Um, and then just getting more villages going. Um, so I think, you know, I think if somebody, when, when people are, a lot of times they just need to kind of learn about the program like they might be frustrated but so we so we bring you know we bring them in we talk to them about our village program and just get them busy with helping out like when it comes to like get, if you get somebody involved coming and helping you know build tiny houses bring a meal to a village those kind of things that makes them feel you know part of the solution and they feel like they're doing you know they, feel, they are doing something i mean they're genuinely really helping out so um so we try to engage with folks when they come to us with those kind of concerns and just get them involved in the program how, how are you handling COVID and how has the pandemic impacted your all tiny home villages and your, your programs there? Um, so, yeah, I mean, we've had to, we've had to change our, uh, you know, well, okay, let me just, let me back up for a second. So it, so the city last year, early in the year, uh, this when when COVID hit, um, the that actually the federal you know the federal government and and the city government and everything declared you know the city government declared a state of emergency, and using uh, using federal uh, dollars, um, they they basically um, you know wanted wanted us to get several villages set up quickly, so we had to sort of like a, a process that would normally take a couple of months uh, took weeks. So something that would normally take three four months took us five weeks to set up a new tiny house village, um, double the size of one of our tiny house villages, Lake Union Village. The new village was TC Spirit Village, and then open an enhanced uh, shelter in the North Seattle area called Lakefront Community House. So we were, we were able to do all that with, you know, um, on sort of on an emergency basis, we had to get that set up quickly. So that's kind of that, that you know, it forced us to really kind of like marshal together our resources and, and, and you know, bring the, together the whole community help, to help with building these and setting these up, and we had, you know, we had a lot of volunteers involved. Uh, but in the villages themselves, um, it's, you know, we've had to put in. Normally, we could have visitors come in the village. People could, you know, donors could bring a meal inside or come and, and meet with residents. 
And, um, and it's, we've had to put some, you know, some new rules in place so that we, we can have the, you know, visitors, it's only the people that live there and the staff. Um, so that's been, that's been hard because people that want to, people that want to have like, you know, come in and talk with the residents or bring meals, they haven't been able to, it's like, it's not as exciting to drop it off at the front gate, you know, their donation or, or the, or the meal that they're bringing. Um, so that, that's kind of affected things. Um, and then, and then like at our urban rest stops, we can only have so many people inside at one time when normally they're packed and bustling, or at least the, especially the downtown one uh, is, is the one that's the most popular. We have one in Ballard and, and, um, and, and until recently in the U district. Um, but, um, but basically we've had, we've had to put in uh, procedures where people are kind of like lined up. Um, people have to line up outside. And there can only be so many people inside at one time. Um, so we just make it as comfortable as possible. We put in, you know, we, we have things we, we put out outside to, to make it, you know, as comfortable as we can, um, because you can only, you know, you, you just have a capacity limit to keep everyone safe um, inside. So it just been like between like the social distancing, the, um, you know, and then, and then the hygiene, you know, we just like sanitize the, the, our staff are just sanitizing the heck out of everything, like every surface, you know, as much as possible. And, and then also doing temperature checks when somebody is, anybody, you know, has to go in and out. They, they actually have an essential need to go in and out for some reason, like a, uh, somebody who's, who's, who is um, visiting, um, then we, you know, we just, we do a temperature check every time. So, um, so yeah, it just, it's been hard because, um, you know, and then a lot of people have like, a lot of people in our villages and served by our programs have lost their, you know, lost their, their job and, and things like that. So it's been, it's just been tough on everyone. Um, and I think that, you know, social isolation where it's like people, you know, we're doing, we can't be together in person. I mean, that's, that's had a, a major effect on people's mental health. So trying to just check in with people and, you know, make sure they're doing okay. And just doing a lot of that. The case managers have been very busy. Um, just, just working closely with all the residents, just checking on people's well being. So yeah. that's a lot of that. A lot of that has increased. So what can people do to help? What can, how can people get involved with Lehigh or just help in general? Because they're often asking me, I don't know what to do. It's overwhelming. So what would you say to people if they're, they're really interested in getting involved? Yeah, well, they could join us um, anytime to set up tiny house villages or build tiny houses. We're doing a lot of that work. Um, we also uh, really appreciate donations. You know, we get donations of of things and meals. We have a, if anybody wants to have a donation wish, you know, we have these desired donation wish lists for all the villages that somebody can refer to and they can organize a donation drive in their community. Um, so there's, those are kind of two, two ways to do that. And, and um, we also have advocacy opportunities. So we, t- we do a lot of testimony with Seattle city council. So if somebody who's interested in doing that um, can, connect with, uh, can connect with us on that as well to be, you know, brought up to date on like, what are the things that we're, advocating for and, and kind of join our advocacy team to call in and, and testify on, on things. Um, so the way that they, the easiest way to get, you know, um, if they want to help with, with setting up a tiny house or with um, getting the tiny house village going, of course we have COVID protocols in place, you know, so people have to, you know, we have an RSVP system and, and um, but it's all, it's, it's, you know, it, it, we, we've figured out how to do this, I think pretty well to keep it safe. Um, so the email tinyhouses at lehigh.org is the email address. Mm-hmm.